If you had one billion dollars and you could build an instrument or a space mission to look at the sun in a new way, what would you do? What, yeah. what's, the, what's to come next? Yes. So, ooh, I, I want to know more about the magnetic fields because they are so important. Um, but perhaps there's two parts to answer that question. Because in terms of what comes next that we have already got funded is a mission called Solar Orbiter, which will get very close to the sun and take images of the sun close up for the first time. So it will get into the sun about as close as Mercury is. So next Monday, when you're watching the transit of Mercury, go in front of the sun, yeah, in your diaries. Yeah, no? <laughs> <laughs> your man um, up here is nodding. <laughs> yeah, <excellent. laughs> Think about the fact that where that planet is, the closest planet to the sun, that's where we're sending our next mission. And it's a European Space Agency mission called Solar Orbiter. So my colleagues are all frantically busy building instrumentation for that at the moment. The whole spacecraft itself is being built in Stevenage. Did you know? Stevenage Centre of Spacecraft <laughs> Technology, um, Airbus Defence and Space. And that will launch in 2018. So the next project for us is to get up close measure, sniff and sense that solar wind and the corona mass ejections up close to the sun before they've evolved and before they reach us, take images close up, but also get outside of or above the plane in which the planets orbit the sun. So we'll, the spacecraft will tilt and be able to see over the poles of the sun. And that's important, actually, for these processes related to the solar um, dynamo, this evolution of the magnetic field, because... All sorts of plasma flows are important, and we can see mostly the ones around the sun's equator, but the plasma flows up towards the poles are really important too, and we haven't been able to see that yet. In terms of what would I do, <laughs> I quite fancy a mission that would just spiral into the sun until it melted or stopped working or bombarded like by particles. like the film particles. Sunshine, right? Get as close as you can. Yeah, actually, on, yes. On a fiery plunge of death. Yes, why didn't the they take some telescopes with them? They Big took mistake. Celine Murphy, that was good enough for me. <laughs> um, we will now open to the floor if any of you have any questions at all. And I'd in particular, I'd urge, if there are any children sat in the audience, please, mm -hmm. please, please put your hand up, because I find, I'm sure you might agree with me, Lucy, that children always have by far the best questions. Yeah, and the hardest. Uh, yeah. Better than any of us grown-ups and then boring, lumbering adults here. <laughs> uh, we have our first question up at the back. Thank you. Um, you were talking about, like, solar flares and those... What are they called? Those eruptions. Coronal mass ejections. Yeah. yeah. Them. Is there going to be, like, at some point, billions of years in the future, like, a massive solar flare or ejection that, like, destroys the whole solar system? So that is also a topic of research. And it's an area where people have drawn from information about other stars. So, for example, NASA's Kepler mission, which looks at visible light coming from other stars. In, and, it, and the main aim is to detect planets orbiting those stars. But a sort of happy consequence is that if there is a visible light flare on those stars, it will also pick them up. And indeed, it has done. So I've, been, I've read a few papers now where studies have shown that sun-like stars, so perhaps ones that rotate at a similar rate to our sun with the similar characteristics, they can show flares that are thousands of times more energetic than our sun produces. And so there's one school of thought that says, OK, well, we've got a snapshot of our sun at the moment producing these fairly well-sized, nice-sized solar flares. But if we use a sample of thousands of other stars, could we then use that as a way of looking into the sun's future, capturing stars at other phases in their, or other um, times of their life? And so some people say, yes, that if we waited long enough, we could see a super-sized solar flare that might be catastrophic for us here on Earth. But my argument would be, well... We understand now that the energy to power a solar flare comes from the magnetic field. It's captured in sunspots. So in order to produce one of these really large energetic solar flares, the sun would have to produce a really large sunspot with a huge amount of stored energy in it. And I don't think at the moment, with our current understanding, we could, that we could say that's possible. So <laughs> on, on the short term, I don't know 
whether to say yes or no. Some of my colleagues would argue yes, and those who are looking at solar dynamo theory might, might, dynamo theory might argue no. So it's very non-committal, but I guess that's science, right? We just, we're still asking questions, but it's a really good question, possibly. Do we have any more questions? What I'll do, in fact, is send two questions at a time so we can bounce back and forth between the microphones. Do we have any questions? In fact, Martin, we've got one right at the front here, mate. Sorry, I was going to wait till you got to the top and then someone back down, which is a bit mean. Uh, so we'll start with you, and then we had a second question up here. Excellent. Hmm. Um, you said at one point what you'd call the edge of the solar system. Is that... <laughs> Just the edge of the Kuiper belt, or is it um, yeah. something else? So, yeah, this is another debate that I have with people, is where, where is the edge of the solar system? So is it where the sun's gravitational influence becomes really weak? So maybe where the Oort cloud is, one light year away, where the comets reside? Is it where the planets end? And that's changed because Pluto is no longer a planet. Um, but I would say the edge of the solar system is where the sun's magnetic influence ends and plasma influence ends. So if you think back to that movie I showed with all the expanding material, we've got the sun in the centre, the solar wind, its atmosphere, expands out to a distance far beyond Pluto to around... Well, in fact, we know where one bit of it ends because the Voyager 1 spacecraft passed through it in 2012, and that was around 18 billion kilometres from the sun. So I, for me, the solar system ends where something called the heliosphere ends. And the heliosphere is that bubble of plasma and magnetic field created by outflowing material from the sun. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have a second question from this side of the auditorium? There's another one in the second row here, Martin. And we'll bounce up to the back. Oh, up in the gallery too. We've got one up in the gallery waiting. Okay, we'll come to you second after, after this one up here. Thank you. I was just interested to know if the, all the sun research was treating the solar system as an isolated system and, and there was any thought about whether there were external um, influences on, on, on the sun. Obviously, physics is a contained system mm. or any of the quantum physics versus any, any, anything kind of more galactic was that in any way an influence or is that just too much sci-fi? <laughs> um, well, it makes me think about theories of the formation of the solar system, certainly, where the idea is that there was a vast cloud of gas and dust that was incredibly thin and stretched over a very large distance, and that some external influence triggered the collapse of some part of that cloud of gas and dust. So perhaps it's the shock wave of a nearby supernova, for example. So certainly for formation of the solar system you push on it a little bit and gradually over time its self-gravity pulls it together to form the sun and the planets um i don't know of i think really well perhaps perhaps then maybe the more modern answer would be that there's lots of research looking at particles coming from outside the solar system and the impacts they have on us so um, particles called galactic cosmic rays they get shielded to more or lesser extents by the sun's magnetic field in the heliosphere. So when the sun's at the height of its cycle with lots of sunspots, it has a strong field in the heliosphere and that deflects the cosmic ray particles well. At times of low solar activity, the opposite is true. The field shrinks and more particles come in. So there are those kind of interactions. Um, then there's been studies around the motion of the solar system through the galaxy is there or isn't there a shock ahead of it? And then we have Voyager data now sending us direct information about what the composition of the plasma is inside the heliosphere and outside the heliosphere. So there, there are areas, but it's, it's really hard to get the data, I suppose. No, so I can't see anything up in the gallery, so this will be a voice from the heavens coming down <laughs> to us. Um, I've heard about those... The flux lines, what were they called again? Oh, the flux ropes, the twisted ones? Yes, were they just magnetic or do they actually have gases inside them? Yes, so <laughs> again, there's always different ways I could answer. Um, so they, they are magnetic with trapped gas in them, so they are both um, components together. But quite often, if you speak to a solar scientist 
They might be a bit more interested in the magnetic field and not talk about the gas, or they might be a bit more interested in the gas and not talk about the magnetic field. We love to simplify things. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm on the magnetic field side, but I do need the gas to trace out the shapes of the magnetic field. But it is important to consider both, because I talked about basically forces on the magnetic flux rope that point upwards and allow it to erupt up away from the sun. Because they actually also contain gas, they have a mass, which means they have a gravitational pull downwards. So you have a bit of a competition between forces that shouldn't be forgotten when you're really thinking in detail about it. Yeah, good question. Excellent. We have a question down here. Do you have a, another question from this side? Uh, yeah, you might as well just give it to the gentleman next to you. We'll come to you second. Um, is it ever possible that um, the sun's magnetic field will become strong enough to, ri to like, rip the Earth's magnetosphere apart? And take it's all doomsday it? from the audience mm. now, yeah. isn't it? I love it. <laughs> How will the sun kill us, Lucy? <laughs> yeah, I can... <laughs> So there's a, there's a really nice piece of science that you're raising, which is how the sun is interacting with the Earth's magnetic field that we call the magnetosphere. And, and I sort of alluded to it, but I didn't talk about it in detail. So when you have a coronal mass ejection come towards the Earth, it can interact with the Earth's magnetic field. So it, our, the Earth's magnetic field is like a bubble around the Earth, and we're sitting then inside the bubble of the sun's magnetic field. So when we have something coming from the sun that reaches us, it can push on the Earth's magnetic field and compress it, set up electric fields, electric currents, the knock-on effects, or it can undergo something we call magnetic reconnection, which means that you get a direct connection between the magnetic field coming from the sun with the Earth. And... It's, Easier to draw. I need to draw my field Picky, lines. Pipe tubes yeah, out, yeah. Oh, I need some something. in your back pockets. Uh, <laughs> I should have bought some. Bought some. Um, but the, the basics or the overview is that if you connect up the magnetic field from the sun to the earth, so yeah, you draw your line directly from the sun to the earth, but that material from the sun is constantly moving. So it connects up to the earth, but at the same time flows over the earth. And that can have the effect of eroding magnetic field on the sun side and building it up on the night side. So you're right, you can open it up. In fact, what happens is a cycle sets up where then the magnetic field moves from the night side back to the day side, something called the Dungey cycle, um, understood by Jim Dungey, who worked at Imperial College. But you can compress and erode the magnetic field. Now, in terms of what we've had in the past, we have had sufficient compression and I think perhaps erosion as well where some of our satellites that were previously inside the magnetosphere have found themselves outside and in the solar wind but again it's probably similar to the question about the solar flare because it all, it all comes down to the amount of magnetic flux and energy um, so perhaps the, the more likely scenario over the long time scale might be also to consider changes in the earth's magnetic field where the Earth's magnetic field might reduce in strength when it undergoes um, a flip, and that maybe what you're saying would become more likely when the Earth's field reduces rather than something intensifying in the magnetic field of a coronal mass ejection. Excellent. Am I neglecting anyone on this side that I can't see? Martin, get the microphone over here, please. Uh, we've got a question lined up. And have we got anyone up in the, up in the heavens again? Not, not yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, I might have got this wrong, you might have alluded to it already. My understanding was, from hearing somewhere, that um, the cycle of selectivity was related to the polarity or, or, or the, the, the sun's poles flipping over from time to time. Uh, is that true? And does that happen on a reg is that the, the regular basis for the, for, for the peaks and troughs of sun's mm. selectivity? And, is, uh, and do we understand why it's happening and will it always carry on at the same yeah. cycle? So you're right. The overall bipole of the sun, so you imagine it's got a big bar magnet inside, as well as the little ones on the surface with the sunspots, that flips um, every maximum in the solar cycle. So at the, around the peak of the cycle, the polarities are reversed. I mean, it's not probably fair for me to say it flips like this. What happens is a reversal at the poles. And 
the way that we are thinking that might happen is that magnetic field that reaches the surface of the sun and forms sunspots breaks up and then starts to get redistributed over the surface of the sun. Um, and in fact, I could probably... Um... So even in this kind of image, you can see the strong patches where the sunspots are, but up towards the pole, especially in the northern hemisphere, you can see that there's sort of a band of black, and that's old sunspot magnetic field, which has disintegrated and been moved by plasma flows towards the pole. And the same has happened in the southern hemisphere. So what we think happens is that at the start of the solar cycle, you've got, I don't know, let's say a north magnetic pole in the northern hemisphere. But the sunspots bring up field that it actually, eventually, it's the... So I said north. So the south magnetic pole of the emerging sunspots is what works its way up to the top of the sun. And it overwhelms the magnetic field that's there, and it has the opposite sign, and it reverses it. And the same happens in the southern hemisphere. So the, the reversal of the polar magnetic field is thought to be a consequence of the formation and evolution of sunspots. But at the same time, allows yeah, the next cycle to play out with the opposite orientation. But to see that, we need to see the poles of the sun, really. And that's what Solar Orbiter will help us to do. Do you have any questions uh, on this side again? Um, yeah, go on then. <laughs> and Martin, we've got one up here, haven't we? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Mr. Oh, yeah. thank you for <clears throat> Thank you for most excellent lecture, Professor Green. My question is in two parts, both of which I think are relatively straightforward, as I hope they are. <clears throat> Could you tell me what the power of the sun is? I've always thought it to be about 10 to the 26 watts, as there be a new revised figure. And also, is it 100% efficient as regards the formula E equals mc squared? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, well, okay, so for the last point, um, I mean, the energy generated by fusion in the core of the sun is, in each reaction, is quite small. And I forget the number, but it's the number of reactions inside the sun that adds up. Because you've got this vast interior sphere where the, where the fusion is happening. Um, and so, yes, I, I think the answer to your first question is, is, is yes. We had um, some new results that came out of, I think it was work by Joanna Haig at Imperial College about how much energy or what the power is that we're receiving at the Earth or say at the top of the Earth's atmosphere per metre squared. Um, and I actually can't remember the number. But if you look up Joanna Haig's work, she has a publication where she talks about that. Um, yeah, I hope that's okay. So, so my favourite fact about the sun, and you might be able to tell me that this is completely rubbish, I've misremembered it, but the energy density at the core of the sun where all the fusion happening is basically the same as a compost heap, and it's just you've got the sheer volume that adds up all that energy. Yeah, that's You're nodding, maybe I haven't yeah. just nodded completely. No, 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 <laughs> that, that is right, because there's a bit... Um, I'm trying to remember what I wrote in the book as well, because we t <laughs> so, there's a lot in there. Um, <laughs> because I, there's a bit where, where it's... It's relevant to talk about the history of, um, of our understanding of energy and the conservation of energy. And there's a ship's doctor, um, Mayer, who's important in this story. So he came to the conclusion about conservation of energy from a completely different angle to, say, someone like Jewel, because he was looking at um, the colour of blood in sailors that he was operating on. And they had different coloured blood, whether they were in warmer or cooler climates. And he had this reasoning that it was about the burning of food and literally producing ash in the blood. But I think it's the case that the energy that is generated within the sailors is, is because of eating food, is higher than the energy per, um, per mass than inside the sun. Mm. It's, a very low it's a very low amount, but it just it adds up. The sun's, sun's quite big, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Will you shout at me if you have any questions from above? Because I can't see hands going up. But we have our next one from over here. Well, it's just a very, very simple question. Um, first of all, um, what 
what type of particles, if any, could you actually measure inside this lecture theatre, you know, when the sun was shining? So which, what sort of particles get right through the atmosphere, right, right down to the surface of the Earth? And secondly, how do these uh, cycles that you've described today affect our ability to use the sun's energy for, you know, for solar power? Yeah, so, so when you say particles, you mean particles coming from the sun? Yeah, so I guess in a, in a very large event, you might pick up... Um, some protons coming from the sun perhaps but what's much more likely is that the particles interact with the atmosphere and then you get showers of protons uh, showers of particles um, and for example neutrons is one of the particles that gets monitored and linked back to solar activity and then the second sorry I've forgotten the second question already it was uh, solar energy and yeah, tell me the again. second question was, do these cycles you've described have any impact or, or effect on our ability to harness the sun's energy to, to generate you know, solar power? Yeah, not, not that I know of. I think variations in the overall light output of the sun, especially in the visible part of the spectrum, is a fraction of a percent over the solar cycle. So minuscule as compared to weather here. We are starting to run out of time, so we'll take uh, one more question from each of the microphones. Um, I'm trying to see who's had the hand up the whole time, and I've just been really badly ignoring. Um, yeah, thank you, Martin. And a question for the second microphone. Uh, should we come down here? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything that theoretical... I'm not a physicist, but is there anything that theoretical physics can learn from this kind of observational work that might help us with, for example controlling fusion reactions on Earth? Yeah, um, that's a good question, because I think I, I, perhaps I always view things the other way around. I'm always thinking, what can I learn from fusion reactions to learn more about the sun? Um, oh, yeah, so because I'm thinking about work where you would build a flux rope in your fusion facility and you would study the instabilities that it undergoes... Um, yeah, I actually I don't know how to answer that question to go the other way around. I think it's probably a reflection on being quite blinkered, <laughs> dazzled by the sun. And our very last <laughs> question uh, from the front here. Thank you. Hello. Um, I know that once a photon's created in the centre of the sun, it takes pretty much forever to get it like out, like from the centre to the outside. Um, is there any is there any like borderline where like it's bouncing and then suddenly it gets free and then it like yes. gets out. And can you tell where that borderline is using your electromagnetic wizardry? Yes. Yeah. Ah, yes. Well, I, I can show you a picture. And in fact, I, I'm almost suspicious um, that's such a great question. It's almost like you planted it. I know. I know. I know. For the end of your talk. <laughs> well, and it is a really nice question. So you're right. When the photons are generated, um, they interact with the electrically charged particles inside the sun and they get scattered. So, and I talked about that when I showed the artificial eclipse images, photons, being, photons from the surface of the sun, visible surface, being scattered by electrons in the plasma leaving the sun. And it's the same on the inside. So they get a sort of um, random walk, like a pinball effect inside the sun. But that's true when you've got a very high degree of what we would call ionisation. So you've got lots of electrons that have been stripped off of the atoms. So you've got lots of electrically charged particles. As you move out through the sun, from the centre outwards, the conditions change and the level of ionisation changes. So once the photons have gone about two-thirds of the way through the sun, they actually start to be absorbed by ions and captured. And then those ions can take that energy with them as they move around the sun, and then they can be re-emitted and absorbed and re-emitted and absorbed. So it, it's really a question of something we call opacity. How easily can the light move through the plasma? And the point at which it suddenly can move freely is, is this point, the photosphere. So at that point, the density has dropped and the ionisation level has got to the point where the photons can easily move through the gas. And the photosphere is um, around 500 kilometres thick, so over, um, well, it's a tiny fraction of the, of the size of the sun. 
And that's why the sun looks like it's got this solid surface, because the layer in which the photons suddenly can escape is really narrow. So it, it sort of misleads us, because you look at this and you think, oh, that looks like a solid surface, whereas actually it's a really low-density gas. But it's just that the photons can escape. Yeah, so it's happening in the photosphere. 